Hi, this is Dr. Emily Schrading with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Colorado. This state level forecast builds on what I shared in my 2050 forecast for the Southwestern region. If you recall the highlights of that forecast, the Southwest is looking at some pretty challenging projections around water availability, extreme heat, fire, and to a degree that many people have not yet considered power generation capacity. I had a ton of people write me from Colorado and from New Mexico asking for more details from the specifics of their states. We're gonna look at Colorado this week and next week we'll look at New Mexico. I thought about doing them together, but these are big states and they really do have distinctive challenges and opportunities coming up in the 2050 forecast. For our Colorado forecast today, we're gonna to talk about some important general trends for the state and then we'll be looking at a lot of maps. First off, some general trends and figures. The ongoing and likely to continue drought is amongst the most serious threats faced by the Southwest. And I am happy to say that Colorado is not as severely directly impacted by that drought as the other states in the region. We're gonna check out a figure here that looks at the precipitation falling into the upper Colorado basin. First though, let's look at some terms. In that name, Colorado is talking about the river. Here, let's look at a picture of this watershed. Colorado is talking about the Colorado River, but as you can see, the upper Colorado basin includes a lot of Colorado, includes a lot of the western slope of Colorado, which is the area of targeted interest for our viewers. So thinking about that geographically, let's look at the precipitation trends. Just a second and I'll pull up our other figures. All right, we got this on the wrong page. Don't worry, we're coming back to this map. Here we go. So if we look at precipitation in the upper Colorado basin, you'll notice that over the last 120 years, there's not really a downward trend. So why is less water flowing into the river? As we can see, there is a distinct downward trend here. That's related to the fact that the upper Colorado basin has been increasing in temperature. So the land, the water that falls in that basin is staying in the basin. The plants are soaking it up. The land is holding it differently than it used to do. As um, the water itself isn't decreasing though, and that's important for people who are engaged in dry agriculture on the Western so slope of Colorado. And as we're gonna see really soon, the agricultural zones for the Western slope are projected to change, but not as dramatically as you might fear. So what we're looking here in terms of water for the uh, Western slope, it's not catastrophic. It's not the type of transformative drought that we might be looking at in say the California Central Valley, unfortunately. What we're probably going to be seeing as a result of all these changes are shifts in land use practice. There's already a lot of high quality dry farming done in this part of Colorado, particularly if you look at some of the wheat producers, and there are more existing dry farming techniques from other more arid places that could be introduced to the Western Slope. Now, let's look at some maps. I want to show you those changes in agricultural zones where we're on it. And most of the maps I know are very confusing that I show here. They're from government reports, but I want to show you that Colorado has been on my mind. So you're going to check this out. This is an example of the quality of map that I can make. This is the cake my husband requested for his birthday. So when I had people write in asking me for information on Fort Collins, on Livermore, the Denver area, the Red Feather Lakes, the Western Slope, I had some concept of the geography, but you can see that the maps I create just don't have the level of detail we need. Maybe I need to work at producing something in between this and the government maps, but if you have problems reading these confusing government maps, I apologize, they are very complicated, but at least they're useful. So let's get over to something useful. I'm gonna stop sharing that and we're gonna go back to the report. Give me just a second. All right, so in this PDF, if you wanna follow along, download the thing. We're going to 1128. Here's our projected shifts in agricultural zones. If you look over here, this is our historic agricultural zones. And this map, it's worth noting, is a little more extreme than we're looking at for the 2050 forecast period. You'll see that the time is a bit further out and that we're looking at RCP 8.5, which means a higher emission scenario. And it looks like we're pulling back from that. So you should have in your mind that this is a little hotter, a little more dramatic than we expect to see by 2050. You see there's big shifts away from blue across the Southwest and a lot more of this extreme red 
But in Colorado, what do we see? A very conserved shift in agricultural zones. And perhaps most importantly, conservation of the freeze. Most of Colorado is gonna maintain its winter freeze. You're gonna have slightly milder winters, but maintaining some degree of that hard freeze, getting those chilling temperatures, as a Midwesterner, I can certainly speak for how important that is for controlling insect populations and plant diseases and keeping trees healthy. It really speaks to the potential for conservation of our important current and traditional land use practices in Colorado. Let's move away from the ag zone map now and we're gonna look at current temperature changes. Go to 1108, scroll down. So this lets us see how temperatures have changed over the last 120 years in the Southwest. And I think that this is key to where people rode in about asking you know, for info on Colorado because a lot of our friends rode in from these places. Keep an eye right here, the sort of north central dot that got real red and the western slope right here got real red. That means that it's had some of the biggest increases in temperature over the last hundred years of anywhere in the Southwest in Colorado. So I can understand why people in Colorado would be very concerned about increasing temperatures, but hold this thought we're gonna look at projected temperature increase next. I wish I could do a map overlay, but I can't. So keep this in your mind real good. This is gonna be good news on this next page. We're gonna look at 1130. Oh no, we're not. All right, now we're doing it. Look down here. These are projected changes in extreme heat around 2050. Look down at our key here. The lighter colors mean you're going to have fewer more days of increase over 90 degrees. If you're looking towards these orange and red, that means a longer summer, longer periods of extreme heat. Our areas that have heated up substantially in Colorado, many of them are not projected to see further increases in extreme heat. And if you look over the Denver metro area, not a lot of projected increases in extreme heat zero to 10 days, it's nothing, little tiny addition to the summer. This was very exciting for me when I dug into the Colorado data. Um, it is not common that I find areas that have had a, pro, uh, a historical heat increase that don't have a big projected continuing heat increase. This is the first time that I've been able to look at a map where some areas have already heated up significantly, such as parts of that Western slope, parts of the North Central area, where it looks like the worst might be over for the forecast period. You shouldn't expect it to cool back down if you're in that overlay region that's had the heating, but now is in the yellow for the projection. It's not gonna cool back down. It's not gonna get like how it was in the 60s, but it also looks like you don't have to expect it to get a lot worse. I, I can't tell you how rare it is. I don't think I've encountered it ever before as I've dug through the data and it's really good news. You may notice this map has also continued good news for the Denver metro area. Denver, I know I haven't been pointing it out, but every map we've looked at has been great for Denver. Everyone knows your beautiful, desirable metro area. It's a real pleasure, I have to say, to show these maps. And as I'm sure you can see, the main change you're looking at in the Denver metro area is slightly milder winters. We're all gonna be impacted by the changes that are coming. But I think we should all be able to agree that it's a real comfort when we look into the data and we see that some nice places are gonna stay nice. Now, Colorado, you had a lot of encouraging news in this forecast. So toughen up for a minute. I gotta show you one quite serious projection and that's related to your capacity to generate power. All right, one, one, two, five. Oh, that time I did it. All right, we're scrolling down. This is the last map. I'm sorry for any photosensitive viewers. I know it's been a lot of shifting, but this is our electric generation capacity map for the Southwest. You'll notice that in Colorado, we have a lot of these red circles, which mean a projected decrease in your power generation capacity around 2050 of a 20 to 32%, very serious decrease in power generation capacities. The temperature increases, however mild in your state, are gonna impact your ability to generate power. It's time for a big power infrastructure upgrade for Colorado. If you wanna identify a sector that is both a challenge and an opportunity, 
It's right there, friends. You saw the maps for the rest of the Southwest. You know things are looking a lot worse for your regional neighbors than they are for Colorado. So like other places that are looking good in the forecast, you gotta get ready for more people to move in. For that, you need a strong energy infrastructure. And I strongly suspect you need it for more people than you've got now. So let's wrap this up. Colorado, you are looking at changes. You are looking at a need to shift land management practices, but I do believe you are looking at challenges you can handle. Most of Colorado will still see cool enough temperatures by 2050 to maintain familiar crops, plants, and landscapes. In areas that have been warmed and will warm more, there are existing dry farming techniques that can be adopted and utilized. The drought trend for the Southwest is super real, but for you, you're looking at more of an indirect hit. You're on the edge of an area with a very challenging outlook, and you should be aware that it will put a variety of strains on your infrastructure. This includes, of course, water, and there will be a lot of demand for that water in the upper Colorado basin. And there will also be strain on your power infrastructure. But get that power infrastructure up to date. And I do believe the majority of folks in your state are looking at a very bright future. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe. Help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.